Welcome everyone to Season 7 of Ancient DOS Games. To kick things off, I decided to tackle a game which I've been wanting to cover for some time, which I have a somewhat controversial opinion about. But this time it's not controversial because it's negative, but because it's positive. The game we're looking at today is 3D Lemmings, and sometimes referred to as Lemmings 3D because of how the title shows up a bunch of different ways, but this is a strange case of a game I feel has done a lot better than a lot of people give it credit for. The funny thing though is that it's not just me. Reviews of the DOS version of the game back when it was brand new were actually pretty positive too. But there's a catch. Most people didn't play this game on DOS. They played it on the Saturn or PlayStation, where it reviewed considerably worse owing to the fact that those game consoles don't have a mouse for pointing at things. This game absolutely needs to be played with a combination of keyboard and mouse controls to get the most out of it. Otherwise, yeah, it'd be an awful experience. And no, this game's not flawless by any stretch of the imagination, but the flaws it does have are flaws I'm either personally able to rapidly adapt to, or which don't bother me. So I'm still going to point them out, I just don't feel they detract from the overall experience. Though I do also understand the point that this is a 3D reimagining of a franchise that was 2D, back at a time when everything was making the jump to 3D, for better or worse. And since this game wasn't actually developed by the original creators of Lemmings, the gameplay itself does have a different overall feel, which I'll summarize at the end of the video, but as you're watching this review, see if you can figure out what that different overall feel is on your own accord. <laughs> 3D Lemmings was actually developed by Clockwork Games instead of directly by Psygnosis, but Psygnosis would be the company to publish it back in the middle of 1995, and as you'd expect, it's a one-player action-slash-puzzle game. It technically has support for SVGA 640x480 256 color graphics, but only uses this mode for still images, and doesn't have to if SVGA support isn't detected with everything else running in a standard VGA 320x200 256 color mode. And as for audio, it supports a fairly typical array of devices, though also keep in mind the game comes with CD audio tracks, though there's a bit of weirdness with them, which we'll get into in a bit. As for its current release state, it's still commercial but relatively easy to find copies of. Sort of. Okay, so one of the things you're going to notice right away when you go searching for this one is that you're going to get tons of results, but 90% of them are going to be for the PlayStation and Saturn ports, and they're all way overpriced, typically with asking prices of $40 or more, and typically being sold for more like $25 to $30, though some sellers try to gouge into the hundreds, despite, again, this game being nowhere near rare. But what's weird about this is that DOS copies are all sanely priced. A heck, loose copies of the DOS version can be found for literally a couple bucks if you get lucky. Though you're more likely to find loose copies between $5 and $10, and boxed copies between $10 and $20. But only if you count the European reissuing of the game in 2001, which is the copy I have. And that simply comes in a DVD-style box with an on-disc manual instead of a physical one. The fully boxed original copies of the game for DOS are very rare, and I wasn't able to properly gauge prices for them because the only sold listing I found was sold way cheaper than it should have. Someone clearly lucked out on that purchase. Basically, if you're trying to aim for a specific release for sake of collecting, it's kind of a mess, but if you just want to play the game, finding a DOS copy isn't too outrageous. Now before you begin playing, there's actually a pretty long introductory animation which depicts the lemmings breaking free from a PC and becoming three-dimensional from their initial 2D form. Now one thing that's really neat about this game is that it has a ton of pre-rendered 3D art in the form of still images before starting levels, to a handful of moderate length FMVs, including the one when you boot the game and one for completing each of the four main sets of 20 levels. Actually, something else you may notice right away is that, by default, the game is configured for left-handed mouse usage. Now, you can turn this off easily enough, or just play the game with it enabled to get used to hitting the right mouse button for most things, but part of the reason it's like this is because many of the keyboard controls for dealing with the camera are situated on the numeric keypad, so it's easier to use the mouse with your left hand and control the camera with your right hand if you're able. There's a few other weird things about configuring this game too, which I should quickly address. The first is that the game has two quote, video modes, labeled 1 and 2, but the manual doesn't do a good job of explaining the differences, as they're both the same actual display mode. 
The difference is that Mode 1 has more performance shortcuts to result in better performance on period correct hardware, but those shortcuts can lead to glitches with some video cards, whereas Mode 2 is more compatible, but worse for performance. So the idea is to use Mode 1 unless there's weird glitching, in which case, use Mode 2. Another weird quirk is that the game has both MIDI music and CD audio, with the CD audio tracks all being high fidelity arrangements of the MIDI tunes and have a wide range of styles and are all pretty much well done and fit the mood of the game. The trouble is that you can only hear the CD audio tracks during actual gameplay. If you're in the menus, you're forced to hear the MIDI music, which fluctuates wildly in terms of volume. I kinda recommend turning off the MIDI music and only using CD audio, which will make your menu silent, but all of the CD audio music is properly balanced, so you'll never blow out your ears that way. And the last thing I find weird is that there's a password system. Now don't get me wrong, the way the password system is done with the 2D lemmings forming the letters out of their bodies is pretty fun, but the game saves your progress every step of the way, so the only reason you would ever need to use this feature is to jump ahead on a brand new computer which doesn't have your prior progress, or to cheat and use a code you found elsewhere from a friend to jump further ahead than you should be. More likely, this is here because of the console ports, which would have needed it so people could play it there without memory cards, as a lot of PlayStation games in particular were designed to support both playing with or without a memory card. Anyways, since this game is in three dimensions compared to two, there is a practice mode available which boils down to what could almost be considered tutorial levels, which are all very simple and are designed to demonstrate either specific lemming professions, specific gameplay features, or specific environmental obstacles and hazards. Now outside of the practice mode are four level sets, fun, tricky, taxing, and mayhem, in order of easiest to hardest, each of which has 20 levels to clear. Once you begin playing the game itself, it's going to become apparent very quickly that this isn't going to play like the 2D Lemmings games. For starters, everything is now locked to a grid of cubes. Uh, sort of. And it's actually a very interesting kind of grid because it can not only have sloped surfaces, but it's divided into four vertical layers for every cube. And knowing that the grid does this is really important to keep in mind, since it absolutely comes into play when deciding how to tackle the puzzles. For instance, the maximum height a lemming can survive a fall from is exactly three cubes. Any higher, and they die on impact. Now, heck, even at that height limit, they almost don't make it and scream in terror as they get stunned on the landing. But they do survive. As with prior Lemmings titles, the goal is to get as many Lemmings to the exit as you can before time runs out, and also as before, each level has a minimum release rate for adding new Lemmings into the level, which you can bump up anytime you want, but cannot drop below the minimum. I should point out, some of the environmental features like springs, teleporters, and rope slides can only have one Lemming using them at a time, meaning if more try to pass over top, they won't be able to use them. If these features are present, it's often a good idea to not adjust the release rate. The big catch though is that, well, everything's 3D now. This means the lemmings are going to be moving in all directions, and figuring out how to make that play out properly can be a bit of a hassle given that the camera's not perfect. Now, you do have controls for turning the camera, moving it forward and backwards, sliding side to side, raising or lowering it, but there are a few catches. The first is that you can't turn the camera up or down, it can only point towards the horizon. This actually makes it surprisingly hard to gauge some aspects of the level designs, though it's not a deal breaker so long as you make sure to align yourself carefully when trying to judge distances and alignment, while using the auto map up at the corner to help you out too. Another catch with the camera is that you can only push one control input at a time. Well, the irony is that this isn't a limit of the engine, just the keyboard handling, but it means controlling the camera can be a bit of a nuisance sometimes since you'll frequently be turning and sliding it in steps to circle it around something. And this sometimes makes it important to take advantage of the fact that every level has four cameras that you can cycle between. In fact, each camera is visible in the world, and thus you can use them as markers to help you remember how you want to do things for any maze-like levels. But the other big catch is that the camera is considered a solid object. It cannot move through solid walls. This was done on purpose to facilitate one of the new features dubbed Virtual Lemming, where you can sort of take command of a lemming directly and see through their eyes and even turn to look at different things as they walk, climb, or whatever, though they'll still move on their own accord. 
The virtual lemming mode is also interesting because if you click on any of the professions you can assign to a lemming, it will immediately take effect for the lemming that you're controlling. Plus, if you click on another lemming, you will jump your vision into that lemming instead. Now, some levels are built specifically to require you to use this feature to find your way through. This also brings up the highlight arrow, which when toggled on, allows you to highlight a lemming to assign a profession to before you pick a profession, which can help with getting climbers or bashers to do their job right when you're trying to get one going out of a huge cluster of lemmings all trapped together. Though I do frequently forget that I have the highlight arrow activated, and I'll sometimes go to put another skill on a different lemming and wonder why I can't. However, that's not an issue. In fact, making mistakes is pretty much not a big deal at all. One of the features pioneered in a prior Lemmings title, which made its way into this one, is the Auto Replay. If you hit the escape key without clearing a level, the game will assume that you want to restart the level instead of ending it. But the instant it restarts, it'll be running a replay of all of the camera positions and actions that you performed. And you can even speed up this replay with the fast forward button. But the neat thing is that the moment you click anywhere outside of the interface buttons, the replay mode ends and you continue playing from whatever point the replay was up to, allowing you to rapidly retry things from wherever you felt things went wrong. And things are definitely going to go wrong, because there's a lot to keep track of here and a number of mechanics which are easy to mess up. Now, before we talk about any specifics though, I should mention the professions that you can assign to your lemmings, of which there are nine, eight of which make a comeback from prior games and function pretty much as you'd expect. Blockers will turn other lemmings back the way they came, bombers explode after a couple seconds, possibly destroying things around them, builders build a staircase which is exactly one and a half cubes tall and three cubes long, Bashers will bash as many walls in front of them as they can before hitting a gap. Miners dig out half-height cubes in front of them and downwards until they hit a gap. Diggers dig straight down until they hit a gap. Climbers climb any solid wall they reach, even if it's sloped to turn them. Floaters can survive any length of fall, and if you give both the climber and floater professions to a lemming, they become an athlete. However, there's one new profession which is the crux of this entire 3D experience. Turners. Firstly, when you assign the turner profession to a lemming, they won't take it on immediately, as you also have to tell the lemming whether to turn left or turn right. This is done by moving the mouse to a position relative to where you want them to turn towards. Thus, if you have the lemming walking from the right side of the camera to the left, you would move the mouse below the lemming to indicate turning left towards the camera, or move it above the lemming to indicate turning right away from the camera. It sounds confusing, but really it just amounts to pointing roughly where you want the rest of your lemmings to go and clicking again to confirm this. The turner will then go up to the edge of the cube that they're on and start causing other lemmings which reach the turner to turn 90 degrees in the indicated direction. But do note that the turner stops at the edge of the block they're on. This means if the lemmings start coming back from the opposite direction, they'll actually miss the turner on the way back and will not turn back the way you had them turn before. So that's something you need to keep in mind. Also keep in mind that you can use two turners in tandem to effectively do the same job as a single blocker. Now let's talk about some of those odd mechanics. The big one that often throws new players off who've played prior 2D Lemmings titles is the aforementioned grid that everything is locked to. Now, me personally, I hated having to be pixel accurate with what I was doing in the original Lemmings games, so I find having things locked to a grid makes the puzzle solving innumerable times easier to figure out, but it can trip you up if you don't take a couple things into consideration. For instance, whenever you assign a profession to a Lemming, they won't actually start performing what they're supposed to until they reach a position which makes sense. For blockers, turners, bashers, and miners, this means they won't start their new profession until they reach the edge of the cube that they're on. Meaning, if you try to assign these professions when they're already up to the edge that you want them to work from, you're very liable to put that effect onto them after they cross that edge. Meaning they'll wait until the next edge before they get started. For those four professions, it's best to assign them while the lemming is in the middle of a cube. Diggers, on the other hand, work from the middle of a cube, so you need to assign the profession while the lemming is on the edges of the cubes so that it doesn't overshoot the cubes that you want to dig into. Well, builders are a little trickier since they lock to half cube increments. As far as I'm aware, there's no puzzles in the game where starting a builder midway into a cube is actually beneficial, so the best time to assign the builder trait is right after the lemming passes the center of the cube that you want them to start building from so that they'll properly start when they reach the edge. 
Again, builders will build a total of six planks going up by one and a half cubes and forward by three cubes. So taking advantage of this exactitude is pretty necessary to survive some of the levels. But then, that is one of the tricks, is how do you even figure out where some of the cube edges are? Not every texture makes it super clear where the edges are, in which case you may have to trial and error it. Which isn't too bad because of the auto replay feature, but can be a bit annoying. Though sometimes you'll have other elements in the level that you can align your camera with to help you gauge positions better. Also, certain decorative elements are often used to give the player hints as to where they should start bashing, digging, building, etc. So sometimes it's good to pay attention to the scenery itself. Also, if you have a really keen eye in the virtual lemming mode, you'll see that the floor textures have some weird perspective warping going on, and this warping itself can also signal how far into a cube the lemming has walked. One of the more insidious mechanics that's probably going to trip you up in some levels is that climbers cannot climb past any quarter height gaps. Now this can be easy to miss in a couple instances and dramatically changes how you're going to approach things when you do notice. Another such mechanic that's easy to miss, which in this case is extremely helpful, is that even though you can't assign professions while paused, you can change which lemming is highlighted. So pausing to select a lemming prior to imparting a profession is often a good thing to do if there's not enough time to do it live. Another weird quirk is that normally blockers and turners cannot be reclassed, except in the bombers. However, if you break apart the ground beneath them, they revert to their prior status. This mechanic is actually used in a few levels, so knowing that you can do this is kind of important. Or perhaps even more pertinent than that is that there's such a thing as one-way blocks and steel blocks. One-way blocks have arrows to indicate that you can only tunnel through them in one direction and no other, while steel blocks cannot be destroyed at all. Slopes are a bit weird too, as lemmings will treat sloped walls, floors, etc. the same as a solid block if they're given a profession that would affect such a solid block. So for instance, if you have a digger dig down through an obstacle and there's a slanted corner beneath it, which lemmings could use to turn 90 degrees, your digger's going to end up digging out that slanted wall too. Thus, it might be better to get them started before that slanted wall comes into effect. Or with the basher and minor professions, if you give one to a lemming while it's walking up a slope, said lemming starts going straight through that slope. That's pretty much all I have to say about the gameplay, but one last very random thing I want to point out is that the game had a Jelly Belly sponsorship attached to it. So you not only see the Jelly Belly logo when starting the game, but all of the confectionery themed levels will have Jelly Belly branding in at least one spot, possibly more. Though the irony is that those levels tend to be some of the easiest. Well, most of the time. So, as you can tell, overall, I enjoy 3D Lemmings much more than the original game. Despite its quirks, the gridlock nature of everything makes it easier for me to solve the puzzles of the levels and get the Lemmings out safely, as trying to be pixel accurate about things in the 2D games is why I didn't enjoy them. But there is something I noticed about the level design as a whole here in 3D Lemmings which actually puts it a step below the level design in the 2D games. Were any of you able to figure out what this weakness was just from watching the footage? It may have been hard to notice, but it has to do with the quantity of professions you're given on each level. See, the original 2D games were a lot more freeform. You generally had more freedom towards finding a solution to the level and making it work given a decent variety of professions on hand. However, here in 3D Lemmings, only a very tiny handful of the levels have any sort of freeform nature to them, with most of them just being straight up puzzled with a very specific solution, or some of them feigning to be freeform until you discover you don't have enough of the professions needed to make your solution work, thus forcing you to solve it the way that it was intended to be solved. And that's the one main weakness of the level design in 3D Lemmings, is that it's much more focused on finding exact intended solutions rather than having the player discover a solution which works for them. Whether that's a good or a bad thing, though, is entirely a matter of opinion. Ironically, this is the first time in a while now where I've had to recommend manually setting the core to dynamic mode when running the game in DOSBox, as I don't believe the game's running in protected mode, as it's not tripping DOSBox to start up its dynamic core by default. 
Likewise, you also need to manually set cycles to max, as the auto setting performs poorly, and fixed counts just cause all kinds of frame rate stutters. The drawback to using the max setting is that when the action is paused, animations will play out lightning fast, but that's a small price to pay to keep the frame rate consistent. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Two Saturdays from now, on the 30th, we're going to do our first ADG Pro video of the season, where I'm actually going to go back to a previously attempted Pro video that I wasn't able to complete to give it a second shot with a different approach. The idea being to find out how quickly you can earn money in the game, and how fast you can buy all of the items in this game using the various methods it makes available to you. So be sure to stay tuned to see which game this is and how that all plays out. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. If you'd like to join the ranks of everyone you see here supporting the show directly, head on over to patreon.com slash K-A-S-I-C-K.